Hi everyone. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about digestive system infections. So in the last lecture, we covered respiratory system infections. And now the second most common infections are digestive infections. So we're going to talk about the digestive system and various infections or diseases. Okay, to start off with our lecture, so we're going to talk about upper digestive tract infections and lower digestive tract infections. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that there are a ton of digestive infections, especially if you're reading the chapter in your textbook. So I tried to focus on ones that are very common, but there are a lot more than these. Okay, to start off with some background. So the function of the digestive system is to break down food. And the reason why we break down food is for energy so that you can grow and build new molecules to build your cells. So that's the whole reason we eat is for ATP so that we can use that ATP from food to build cell membranes, ribosomes, all the things we talked about during our first month of class. And feces are the solids resulting from digestion that are eliminated, that we're not used. So keep that in mind. So with the anatomy and physiology, we're just gonna do a basic anatomy of the digestive system. The digestive system usually, like if I was drawing it up on the board, I like to draw as one tube. That's the beginning of the tube is the mouth and then the bottom of the tube is the anus and then you have all the organs in between. So that's the digestive tract. And just so you guys know, the gastrointestinal tract, sometimes people confuse both. That one refers to the stomach and intestines. So when we talk about GI diseases, we're talking about intestinal stomach diseases. And then there's a lot of accessory organs, which we will talk about, but basically it's salivary glands, liver, pancreas. So the digestive tract, that tube that I was talking about that goes from the mouth to the, to the anus, if we're covering everything in it, it's mouth, then your throat, which I remember we talked in respiratory systems called pharynx, then the esophagus, then the stomach, then the small intestine, then the large intestine. So that's how food passes through this tube. Again, it starts out with mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then anus. That's how food is processed. That's how we get nutrients from it from beginning to end. So from the moment you eat until everything that's not used is let out. Accessory structures that aid in this process are the teeth and tongue, salivary glands. So teeth and tongue help with... Um, mechanical digestion and then salivary glands help with chemical digestion so having enzymes that help further break down food and then the liver and gallbladder help with digestion of various things such as fatty foods and then the pancreas also plays its role in secreting digestive enzymes so keep that in mind and then do you guys have the PowerPoint on Canvas so you can see the function of all of the different organs? I'm not going to get into it because it's not an anatomy class, but this is basic structure. So diseases of the digestive system are very common. Remember we said that the most common illnesses are respiratory system illnesses, and that's because we're always breathing. Well, the next thing you're always doing is you have to eat. So the next most common um, illnesses are digestive system illnesses, and that's because you have contact with bacteria all the time orally. So you can eat contaminated food or um, contaminated water or a kiss someone, so anything like that. And with digestive system, the route of transmission is fecal oral. We talked about this a lot in class. This does not mean that someone is eating their feces. It basically means that someone went to the bathroom and didn't wash their hands and then they either prepared someone else's food or ate themselves. Or a good example, and I've mentioned this to you guys before, is also changing a diaper. Maybe changing a baby's diaper and then not washing your hands and making food. So you people can get really sick this way. That's what fecal oral transmission is. And it can be both from animal or human feces. It's basically um, you get the feces run off contaminated food or water, hands to mouth, and then oral anal sex can also lead to these diseases. This cycle of transmission can be broken by people basically making sure that they wash their hands when they prepare food. This is the reason why we wash our hands before preparing food. Disinfecting drinking water, especially if you live in an area where, for example, like cholera is very common, and then proper disposal of sewage. So making sure everything is disposed of properly and not going into people's drinking water. Um, and to talk now, I'm going to briefly mention normal microbiota and defense mechanisms. So the whole lecture is based on illnesses, but 
we do have a lot of things in place that protect us so that you're not constantly ill. We have our normal flora in our mouth called the oral flora, and there's many, many different types of bacteria in your saliva, and they colonize your mouth so that bad pathogenic bacteria cannot take over. There is also a lot of no, um, normal flora in your large intestine. Small intestines, large intestines, so these are digestive flora that protect you against pathogens and also help in digestion. We talked about it in host microbe interactions. In the stomach, our stomach is very acidic and this is very good for us because that acid makes sure that not a lot of bacteria grow. Remember, a lot of bacteria are neutrophils, they're not acidophils, they're killed by acid. So in the stomach, the stomach produces a lot of acid, but the stomach lining, so inside the stomach is acidic, like if we're looking at the stomach inside of it, is acidic, but then the lining of it is very alkaline or basic. So that's the mucous membrane. A lot of bacteria can't survive in the stomach. A long time ago, it was thought of as sterile, but now we know that there's few bacteria that can grow there. And then there's few microorganisms in the small intestine due to these things called panic cells, which a lot of uh, anatomy folks know this. So these are cells basically um, that are phagocytic cells. So they produce proteins that help break down um, pathogens, just to summarize it. And then in our large intestine, again, there's a lot of bacteria. There's all types of bacteria in the large intestine, namely anaerobic and facultative anaerobes because there's a lot of anaerobic areas in the large intestine. And then keep in mind that there's 100 billion bacteria per gram of feces. It's not like urine. With urine, urine is almost sterile. With feces, um, there are a lot more bacteria. So for upper digestive tract infections, we're going to learn about Dental caries, which means cavities, periodontal disease, which is cum disease, and peptic ulcer disease. And then we will talk about lower digestive tract infections. So upper digestive tract infections are anything that includes um, the stomach up. And then lower digestive tract infections are basically intestinal um, illnesses. That's how I would classify them. Okay, we're going to start off with our first upper digestive tract infection, which is dental caries. Many people don't think of this as a digestive infection, but it is. Anything infecti uh, affecting your teeth is considered a digestive infection. So for anyone in class going into um, dentistry or dental school, you'll spend a lot of time learning about this. The reason we're covering this in microbiology is that cavities or tooth decay or dental caries are caused by bacteria. And we're gonna learn about that. So plaque, which we learn about in teeth, is basically communities of bacteria, which we call biofilms, and that's what forms tooth decay or dental caries. The reason why plaque forms this is because the layers of the teeth start eroding, and then the bacteria, the acid they produce starts affecting everything, and you get tooth decay. So the tooth starts falling apart, and very bad cases of cavities, and again, it's called caries. So the cause of dental caries is streptococcus mutans mainly. It's a lot of different streptococcus bacterial species. And remember, streptococcus are gram-positive coccus bacteria. These bacteria can take, when um, we eat sugar, so table sugar is sucrose, these bacteria convert sucrose to lactic acid and dextrin. Lactic acid is why our teeth decay. It's not the bacteria, it's the byproduct of them breaking down sugar. That's why sugar is bad for us. So they produce acid, the acid starts wearing down the teeth, and then they also produce dextrin. Dextrin is a sugar, a polysaccharide, that helps the bacteria stick to each other. So every time that you're eating sugar, and let's say you're not brushing your teeth or little kids and there's sucrose there, the streptococcus bacteria, various types such as streptococcus mutants, will take it and metabolize that sugar into lactic acid and dextrin. Lactic acid starts wearing out your layers of your teeth. And the layers of your teeth, again, from, and just to make it very simple, from the outside inside, outside to the inner surface is enamel. So that's why we talk about protecting your enamel. Then the dentin, 
and then the pulp. And so the pulp cavity is where you hit into the nerves. This is where you do not want to get into. So if bacteria have metabolized sucrose so much and there's a lot of lactic acid being produced, the first layer that's going to wear out is the enamel, then the dentin, then the pulp. When you get to the pulp, things start getting very serious. Another cause or etiology of dental caries are either lactobacillus bacteria, which are gram-positive rods. And there's a lot of other bacteria, but the two main ones involved with cavities are streptococcus mutans and lactobacillus species. And if you were to do a gram stain, they would be gram positive, they're purple. The epidemiology of these is um, transmission is from oral bacteria, especially from contact with parents. The most common affected age are little kids because they eat sugar and they don't brush their teeth and older adults because with time, a lot of their teeth layers have worn out. Genetics also, maybe some people have genetics that gives them a softer tooth enamel or saliva genes. Remember, some of us have more IgA than others. And also a diet high in sucrose promotes a lot more tooth decay because what happens is these bacteria, the streptococcus mutants, start breaking down the sucrose into lactic acid and then the lactic acid starts wearing out the, out the teeth. So here is streptococcus mutants growing in glucose and here they are growing in sucrose. So in glucose, nothing happened. In sucrose, you can see that they start forming biofilms. And the reason I wanted to mention this is there's a lot of gum out there. And if you look at gum, remember anything that ends in OSC is the sugar. If your gum has sucrose, that's spot bad. But if it has other types of, su uh, of sugars, it's not that bad because these ones specifically metabolize sucrose. Okay, so how do, does tooth decay occur? The process starts when bacteria attached teeth using their capsules. So these are bacteria that form capsules. Remember capsules are a layer outside the cell wall. And they start, if there's sucrose there, what they do is they metabolize the sucrose and they produce lactic acid. So the lactic acid will start attacking the enamel. And then if you get more lactic acid, they'll start attacking the dentin, the second layer, and then potentially you start getting into attacking the nerves or the pulp. So these are the stages. That's why if you have a cavity, treating it early on is much better than later on. Even though a lot of people really dislike going to the dentist, going early on where you've just affected the beginning layer of the enamel is much better than when it's gone to the dentin or even the pulp. And brushing teeth is important. The signs and symptoms of um, cavities or caries, which you guys all know, are tooth decay, discoloration, hole in the tooth enamel if the acid is so bad that it's broken into the cavity, and then severe pain. So you get a lot of pain and a lot of inflammation. Treatment are filling. So remember, we're wearing out the different layers of the teeth. So the best way to treat this is to refill that area so that you don't get more decay into the dentin and the pulp and then root canal in bad circumstances. Prevention is really good dental care. So brushing teeth, flossing, um, lowering sugar, lowering sucrose diet. Fluoride is really good. And then sometimes children get sealants so that if they're not brushing their teeth, which young children tend not to do all the time, you have a, an extra layer of protection. The next uh, digestive tract infection we're gonna talk about is periodontal disease. This is also an oral infection. So this is basically gum disease. This is when we have bacteria that trigger a lot of inflammation in the gum. So periodontal disease is gum disease, and then dental caries are cavities. So with gum disease, this is characterized by a lot of inflammation that starts wearing out the gums. And there's two terms I want you guys to differentiate, gingivitis and periodontitis. So gingivitis is when you have gum inflammation and infection. Chronic gum inflammatory disease is periodontitis. So basically both are bad inflammation of the gums. And we're going to go through them when we talk about the pathogenesis of how periodontal disease happens. So with periodontis, you have the, so around your teeth, you have your gums. So the bone and tissue that's supporting your teeth starts getting wear, worn out from all the inflammation. And the inflammation is trying to fight off the bacteria that's there. 
Gum disease or periodontal disease is caused by mostly gram-negative anaerobic rods. And anaerobic, you guys don't have to memorize this if you were um, taking like a dental exam. You wouldn't memorize this because you can think about it. Your gums are very anaerobic areas. There's not a lot of oxygen going there. So that's why it's gram-negative anaerobic bacteria that can go there. But um, gram, they can be gram-positive, but it is mostly gram-negative. Whereas with cavities, it was gram-positive bacteria mostly. It's uh, the transmission is contact, especially with parents and spouses. That's how you get the bacteria. And its age also plays a big factor in getting periodontal disease. Almost 90% of cases are at 65 and above. Genetics plays a role in how, um, how the condition of your gums. Smoking can really, really increase periodontal disease. And then pregnancy, we see a high amount of periodontal disease in pregnant women because of all the hormonal changes and all the blood making, it, making you a lot more prone to getting these infections. Okay, with the pathogenesis, you if you look at teeth, you have healthy gum. So healthy gum here between the teeth. You get plaque buildup here, which again is a community of bacteria here. Let's assume that there are gram-negative anaerobic rods. And eventually you get this bacteria buildup and your immune system kicks in. So your immune system tries to do a lot of inflammation to fight them off. So with gingivitis, initially you get a lot of toxins from the bacteria and this causes irritation and if this continues you can get periodontitis so gingivitis can develop into chronic gum disease which is periodontitis and this is when the gum gets separated from the teeth and ultimately the gum the gingiva and the bone are, get completely destroyed so these are images of people whose gums have worn out Symptoms, you a lot of bleeding gums, this is the main symptom, and then pus pockets, so white blood cells. The treatment is to try to remove as much of the damage as possible. So this is where we do deep cleaning, and then people can get surgery to restore the gum and antibiotics because it is a bad bacterial infection. Prevention is similar to cavities, so good dental hygiene. This is where flossing is very important with periodontal disease. This is why everyone's told to floss all the time. It's more important for periodontal disease than cavities. And then plaque removal, so getting teeth uh, really cleaned, at, well cleaned at dental offices. You can get complications from gum disease. So sometimes when people have infected gums, rarely they can get Inf infection of their heart, so endocarditis. So this is infection of heart valves where you get inflammation there. And that's because the bacteria can start spreading from the gums to these tissues and it can lead to a lot of different things. You can get bacteremia, which is bacteria in the blood, and you can get premature birth from too much inflammation. So that's why pregnant women, it's all important to have their teeth checked and important that they are making sure that there, if there is any periodontal disease, they're aware of it early before bacteria can further spread. So here's a summary of the oral diseases we talked about. So we talked about dental caries there, etiology is streptococcus mutans and periodontal disease they're mainly caused by gram-negative anaerobic rods and then you guys have the slides and here's a summary just summarizing everything i said in your slides the next disease we're going to talk about is ulcers um so gastritis or peptic ulcer disease this is my favorite disease because this is what my degree is in so gastritis is stomach inflammation. Anyone mentions, anytime someone mentions the word gastric, it means stomach. Gastritis and peptic ulcers are caused by bacteria H. pylori. And H. pylori are gram-negative helical bacteria. So if you look at them under the microscope, they're helical, they're not rods, and they're not caucus. This is where they get their name. And they are responsible for many infections in the world, causing stomach inflammation, which again is gastritis, and ulcers. Ulcers are basically wounds in the stomach, so very painful wounds. Epidemiology, I would say almost over half of the world is infected with H. pylori, so it is a very, very prevalent infection, and it's very common in low socioeconomic groups. It's likely transmitted via 
fecal oral routes, but the newest research suggests that it is probably mainly genetic and it can be in areas that don't have really good sanitation, so bacteria found in well water. The pathogenesis of H. pylori. So I'm not going to get into the detail of this, but let's say someone drinks a cup with H. pylori in it. H. pylori will go down and get to the stomach, and H. pylori is unique in that it can survive in the acidic stomach environment. The reason it can is unlike most bacteria, H. pylori has an enzyme called urease. Urease converts urea in the stomach. Urea is what makes the stomach so acidic into ammonia, and ammonia makes the stomach more alkaline. So a lot of times people teach this bacteria and they say it's an acidophile. It's not an acidophile. It does not like acidic environments, but it can tolerate them because it has the enzyme to break them down, which a lot of bacteria don't. So after it does that, it digs itself into the lining of the stomach and that's where it grows. It doesn't like to grow in the cavity of the stomach. It would rather grow in the lining of the stomach where it's less acidic and it causes, um, by it being there, we get a lot of damage to the lining of the stomach because of the inflammation that our body is doing to try to fight it. And there, and you also get a lot of decreased mucus production. Mucus is there to protect our cells. So infections can persist for years and often people have the infection for life. 90% of people with stomach cancers have H. pylori. And we have noticed that people with stomach cancer, if it is treated early, antibiotics can be a huge help. Symptoms of H. pylori infection or gastritis or ulcer disease is stomach burning. So usually people will complain that they see, get a lot of stomach pain or when they haven't eaten or they've eaten something more acidic. It's not the food itself. It's that your lining is already inflamed. So anything that can irritate it, such as acidic foods or caffeinated foods, will cause more pain. Most infections actually are asymptomatic or very little pain. Almost everyone infected gets gastritis, so got inflammation of the stomach, and this too much inflammation can, in rare cases, lead to stomach cancer. So you start off with gastritis, which is inflammation. More inflammation can lead to ulcers, which is a wound, and then a lot more inflammation can lead to stomach cancer, where you've worn out all that tissue from all the inflammation. Treatment is antibiotics. People are on a lot a double antibiotic regimen where you get two different types of antibiotics and they also are taking proton pump inhibitors and acid reducers. But proton pump inhibitors and acid reducers function in one thing, to lower acid production. The reason why they do that is that your stomach lining, if you have an ulcer, is so inflamed that acid burns and causes a lot of pain. So that's why people take these drugs. And prevention, you can't really prevent it, but your textbook says good hygiene, so I'm following it. But I don't think there's much to ways to prevent it. And about 1% of people who are infected with H. pylori can develop stomach cancer. So here's a summary that you guys can read with the slides that you have. Now we're going to talk about lower digestive tract infections. So I'm going to talk about bacterial gastroenteritis, viral gastroenteritis, which people typically call like stomach flu, C. diff infections, and then three different types of hepatitis. So with lower digestive tract infections, we're talking about infections that, infect, that affect basically your intestines. And then with hepatitis, it's liver. So gastroenteritis is when you have inflammation of your intestines and it can be caused by various bacteria or various viruses. I'm gonna focus on gastroenteritis that's caused by bacteria. The etiology of gastroenteritis can be many different bacteria, but common ones that I want you to know are E. coli. So whenever you hear of like E. coli outbreaks, usually it's specific types of E. coli. Examples of E. coli are enterotoxigenic E. coli and Shiga toxin producing E. coli. Both of these can cause gastroenteritis. And they do that by producing toxins that make a person have very bad inflammation and diarrhea. Salmonella enterica, which is sometimes found in undercooked chicken, is a gram-negative rod and it causes a lot of gastroenteritis. Same thing with Campylobacter jejuni. This is found in undercooked chicken. And then there are many other bacteria that can cause gastroenteritis. So Vibrio cholera, Yersinia, many others. But I want you to keep in mind that 
E. coli, Salmonella, Enterica, and Campylobacter jejuni are very prominent ones, but there are a lot of bacteria that can cause inflammation of the intestines. Epidemiology, these diseases are all transmitted by the fecal oral route, so people ingesting contaminated food and water, water oral anal contact, and pathogens. So a lot of bacteria cause gastroenteritis. Those with very low infectious doses, meaning ones that you need very few to get sick, are easily transmitted by people because you don't need such a high dose. And keep in mind that many, many thousands of children die every year of diarrhea diseases, many of them, because they could not keep the diarrhea under control, especially in different parts of the world. And contaminated food, so beef, poultry, tree eggs, um, water, milk, are very common food sources for Campylobacter bacteria and Salmonella. This is why it's important to cook food, boil milk, all of these things. Petting zoos, animals carry a lot of bacteria that also can cause gastroenteritis. So the take home message from this is wash your hands. Pathogenesis of these, there's so many different bacteria, so I cannot get into the specific pathogenesis, but what you could, the main thing is that these bacteria affect the small intestine and or the large intestine. So with these, they have different virulence factor. One common virulence factor that bacteria have that can lead to inflammation and diarrhea are enterotoxins. So enterotoxins are toxins that E. coli, for example, produces that cause a lot of water and electrolyte loss. And then some bacteria produce toxins that can cause cell death. And these toxins, which are not that common, they can lead to bloodstream infections. With symptoms of these, this is basically what we would term as food poisoning. So diarrhea, dysentery, I want you guys to know this term. This is when we see blood and mucus in the diarrhea cramps, nausea, vomiting, may or may not have fever. Usually fever is not common, but it can be seen with what we would term as food poisoning. Treatment, there really isn't a treatment. Um, if you ever have had food poisoning, it's fluid and electrolyte replacement. You may have, you may take antibiotics, but it's rare because it's self-limiting. Self-limiting meaning it's letting itself out either through vomiting or through a lot of diarrhea. So the bacteria is coming out. And so with these, rehydration is very important. The lack of rehydration is what can lead to fatal cases of gastroenteritis. Prevention is to wash food and cook food. There can be possible complications of gastroenteritis. If you get the bacteria spread to the blood, this can be very bad. If it spreads to other organs, kidneys, so hemolytic uremic syndrome can be caused by E. coli 157H7. Gay and bar syndrome can happen with Campylobacter jejuni infections. And this is an autoimmune reaction where your body is having such a big reaction to the bacteria that it, the immune system creates these complexes that start attacking nerves. It is rare, but it can happen. So that was gastroenteritis caused by bacteria. Now I'm going to talk about gastroenteritis caused by viruses. So um, what we term as food poisoning can be caused by bacteria and it can be caused by viruses. Viral food poisoning or what we term the stomach flu, which again has nothing to do with influenza, can be caused by rotavirus, neurovirus, and a lot of other viruses. But rotaviruses and neuroviruses are the most common viruses that cause gastroenteritis. They're super contagious and they're transmitted through the fecal oral route that's why washing hands again can stop these infections aerosolized vomit means that um, you have someone who has this infection maybe you have a family member and they get food poisoning and then they throw up and you're cleaning after them and you breathe it in so keep that in mind they are very contagious age distribution uh, little kids are uh, very prone to these infections and neurovirus can be a hospital acquired infection that affects these immunocompromised patients. These viruses affect mainly the upper small intestine. Symptoms are vomiting and diarrhea, and we treat them with 
basically just giving the person fluid, just like bacterial gastroenteritis. Rotavirus typically goes away within one week. It's a very tough one week of vomiting and diarrhea, and neurovirus takes about two to three days. Prevention, um, there is a rotavirus vaccine. Little kids get the rotavirus vaccine. It's an attenuated oral vaccine, so they take it when in their first year of life. We do not have a vaccine right now for neurovirus. Now we're going to talk about C. diff, so Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile causes colitis. It's a very common infection. There are antibiotic associated very severe diarrheas, and we've seen a high increase in, I'm going to start calling Clostridium difficile C. diff infections from now on, since the early 2000s, because people are taking a lot of antibiotics. So this is bad inflammation of the colon. When I say colon, I mean large intestine. So it's a life threatening colitis where you see a lot of perforation of the intestinal walls, so holes in the intestinal walls. Colitis is caused by a bacterium called Clostridium difficile. A lot of times people call it C. diff. It's a gram positive rod, so if you look at it under the right microscope, it is rods and they form endospores. This is very bad for us because the endospores are resistant to disinfectants, um, heating a lot of different things so controlling c diff outbreaks is very hard because they form these endospores that are so resilient and these endospores can sometimes be ingested and then go to the large intestine where they can become vegetative and start reproducing again the epidemiology of colitis is that there, it's primarily a hospital infection, so we see it a lot in hospitals. So patients in hospitals, it is very common and it can be life-threatening because patients there are already immunocompromised. The transmission is fecal-oral, so ingest endospores and the in endospores can be shed in feces. That's why if you're going into the health field, so if you're um, with nurses, this is very common. If you're cleaning after a patient, make sure you're well covered because the endospores are shed in feces. And these cause more infections than any other intestinal infections combined, and they are very severe. We see a high amount with older, older patients, immunocompromised patients, and patients who are in hospitals for a very long time or who are getting any gastrointestinal surgery. There are a few asymptomatic carriers, so that's why people have to be very careful, especially if you're going into the health field. Pathogenesis is that these affect the large intestine and they cause dysbiosis. So if you guys remember, dysbiosis is when we have bacteria moving there enough um, where they would naturally be found. They produce toxins, and these to so these bacteria produce toxins and these toxins are very lethal to intestinal epithelia. They, get, they produce a lot of inflammation and it's all the inflammation that wears down people's colon. So it's this intense amount of inflammation of your body trying to fight the bacteria and over time the colon just just loses its function and structure the signs and symptoms of someone having colitis can range. They can be from very mild to severe. We see diarrhea, we see dysentery, which is blood and a lot of mucus in the feces. Cramps, there is a distinct odor. I did want to mention this because the bacteria are metabolizing different components and producing gas. You may or may not have fever, and there are very serious cases of colitis, which can, which are called pseudomembranous colitis. And with these, these are very life-threatening cases of C. diff colitis. Treatment are to try to limit antibiotics because antibiotics are getting rid of all of our good bacteria and it's that good bacteria that keeps C. diff in check. So there are, um, it's interesting because C. diff is usually caused because people are taking so many antibiotics, but then when someone does have the infection, sometimes they are prescribed antibiotics. So it is a double-edged sword of trying to control these infections. This is why it's important to take care of your normal flora. We are seeing resistant strains emerging, and this right now is on the list of urgent infections that the Center of Disease Control has listed for something that we need to be aware of 
it's on there this year and it's been on there for years. Probiotics may help and fecal transplant has been shown to be very promising for colitis patients. Fecal transplant is exactly what it says. So if someone has, a, has colitis, you take feces from a healthy individual and you put them back into the individual who has colitis and you do it through the anal route typically. And hopefully you're giving them back the good bacteria so that their body can use someone else's healthy bacteria to overcome these bacteria. Prevention is hand hygiene. So this is very important for everyone going into healthcare. And even if you don't go into healthcare, you are gonna have family members and friends in hospitals to make sure that people are really washing their hands, wearing gloves, being very careful. Isolating patients who have C. diff infections and making sure that we're really cleaning after patients who have C. diff infections. Complications are they can reoccur in 20% of people. You can see very bad pseudomembranous colitis and in very rare cases, there's something called toxic megacolon. And this is where colitis is just so toxic that the colon expands so much from all the inflammation and all the bacteria there. And here is the summary of C. diff infections. So I made these tables here for you guys to look at the summary of the infections we've talked about. The final thing, um, lower digestive tract infections I want to talk about is hepatitis. So hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. There are at least five different viruses that cause hepatitis. So when you hear about like hepatitis A, B, C, D, they're unrelated viruses. They have nothing to do with each other. The only reason they're called that is because they all cause hepatitis. So they're completely unrelated viruses, but they all cause inflammation of the liver. I wanted to remind you guys, it's not an anatomy class, but the liver is very important. We cannot live without a liver. It functions to de for detoxification, making proteins, producing chemicals for digestion, making important hormones, and making um, macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, proteins. For hepatitis, we're gonna talk about three different hepatitis infections. We're going to talk about hepatitis A, B, and C. And the most noticeable sign of hepatitis is jaundice, which is where you see yellowing underneath the eyes and in the eyes. Hepatitis, we're talking, this is a microbiology class, so we're talking about hepatitis induced by viruses. But keep in mind that the liver can be inflamed by other things, so you can get hepatitis by alcohol, too much Tylenol, acetaminophen, so Tylenol, or drugs that have acetaminophen and other chemicals that damage the liver. By the way, this is the main reason why there's dosages. So when you take Tylenol, like for example, it's say four to six hours to take another dose, it's because if you overdo it, you start damaging your liver because Tylenol, the component in Tylenol, acetaminophen, is broken down in the liver. And if you take too much at one time, your liver cannot keep up with it. So we're going to start off with hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is caused by the hepatitis A virus, and it's fecal oral transmission that's through contaminated food, water, or fomites, meaning objects. So if the virus is on the objects, you can also get it through oral anal sex. It's an acute disease. It's this is pro this is probably the least. Um, virulent hepatitis out of all of them, hepatitis A. It is very common. It, anyone can get it. So if there you drink contaminated water, you can get hepatitis A. This virus invades liver cells and it starts causing inflammation there. It can be asymptomatic. Most symptoms are subclinical, meaning you don't see any symptoms at all. Fever, headache. I would say the biggest symptom of hepatitis A is ex feeling extremely tired. I've had hepatitis A before from eating contaminated food. And treatment, there is none. Usually people recover in month, but because their liver is remaking all the cells that have died. Prevention, there is an inactivated vaccine and there is immune globulin pre or post exposure. Usually we don't really do anything for people who have hepatitis A. You just tell them to take care of themselves and their body so that the virus can leave slowly. Again, it is very common. And the immunoglobulin pre or post exposure, meaning you have someone who has hepatitis A and you can give them different immune cells so that their body can target the virus faster. But typically people don't do anything. They recover 
recover. It just takes a long time to recover. Now, the more severe hepatitis is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is transmitted through contaminated blood or semen. It's similar to HIV, and it can be transmitted to babies at birth if the mom has hepatitis. There is a lot of chronic carriers. Pathogenesis is that it these actually i think i have a picture of pathogenesis in the next slide for you guys just know that there is an acute phase but it can become chronic and it can it becomes chronic and in infants if they do get hepatitis b that's why babies take a hepatitis b vaccine the only thing I want to mention about hepatitis B regarding the virus is the virus synthesizes DNA from RNA, so it does reverse transcription. We saw this with HIV. So what it does is it infects your cells like what viruses do, and it's an RNA virus. It releases its RNA. It has the enzyme that converts RNA to DNA, and then you once it makes DNA, it starts making using your liver cells to make more copies of that DNA and doing transcription translation to make more hepatitis B viruses. So a lot of treatment with this is similar to HIV treatment. Symptoms, a lot of times they're subclinical and it's similar to hepatitis A virus, but there is no headache and there is more like, it's more likely to progress to severe liver damage. So again, hepatitis B is a lot more virulent than hepatitis A. Treatment is reverse transcriptase inhibitors so you don't have the conversion of RNA to DNA, interferons to help with the immune system, and in very bad cases, a liver transplant. Prevention, there is a hepatitis B vaccine. The hepatitis B vaccine is recommended for all babies at birth, and there is immune globulin post-exposure. So if someone has it, there is treatment to help them control it. You can get psoriasis and liver cancer as chronic hepatitis B infections carry on. Finally, the last hepatitis I want to talk about is hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is caused by the hepatitis C virus, and it's transmitted through contaminated blood, rarely semen, mostly blood. It can transmit to babies at birth, and there are chronic carriers. The pathogenesis is that it infects the liver and causes chronic infections, so the infections carry on. The symptoms are very similar to hepatitis B virus, but this is more likely to be chronic, so carry on in someone's lifetime. Treatment is only for chronic um, cases that have become very bad, so antiviral medications to try to control the virus, interferons to boost your immune system, and a liver transplant if the chronic infection is very bad. Prevention, there is a vaccine that's been being developed for a while now, and possible complications can lead also to psoriasis or liver cancer. So both hepatitis B and hepatitis C are transmitted by blood, and hepatitis A is contaminated food or water. Other hepatitis B viruses, I don't want to focus too much on this, but just know, for example, hepatitis D is linked to hepatitis B infections. So people who have hepatitis B will oftentimes get the hepatitis D virus as well. So you see these two hand in hand. Hepatitis E virus is not as prevalent as hepatitis A, but it is very similar in that both are spread by fecal oral transmission. It is in endemic in areas with poor sanitation. That's why we have to be careful with making sure that we have very good sanitation to try to control hepatitis A and hepatitis E. And to summarize them, hepatitis A and E are transmitted through contaminated food and water, and then B, C, and D are transmitted by contaminated blood. Actually, uh, hepatitis D, sorry, is not like that. Hepatitis D is a co-infection after someone's been infected with hepatitis B. So those were the digestive system infections. I hope you guys now can go through and list with every infection, what's the etiology, what's the cause, um, what's the prevention, what's the treatment, and hopefully this helps you when you guys go into healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I will end it from here.